Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm David Tennant. In the news this week, there's concern on the beach in Newquay as David Blunkett goes missing on a surfing holiday. At Westminster, Labour MP Ben Bradshaw explains the drawbacks of having an office directly below the Scottish Nationalists. Well, twice I've had urine pouring through from the upstairs gents through my office ceiling into my office. <laughs> and at Stafford Prison, after his wobble board is confiscated, Rolf Harris is unhappy with the replacement. On Ian's team tonight is a ceramic artist who's also on record as being a supporter of the Labour Party. Wow, <laughs> three quid a pop. Who isn't these days? Please welcome Grayson Perry! <laughs> and with Paul tonight is a comedian and host of BBC Two's Search for the Country's Best Salon Stylist in a show called Hair. Filming was chaotic, as nobody did anything until the director shouted, cut. Please welcome <laughs> Catherine Ryan. <laughs> so, we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Grayson, take a look at this. It's tax credits. Oh, look, it's the Grayson Perry lookalike competition. <laughs> I think these guys sort of gave it to George Osborne with a statutory instrument. <laughs> the House of Lords threw out the tax credits bill. It's a triumph for... The forces of non-democracy. <laughs> yeah. The right result, but a slightly strange set of means. Indeed, it's the government's historic defeat in the House of Lords over George Osborne's tax credit cuts. It's a case of, like, the wrong people doing the right thing, isn't it? Like, if white supremacists had a bake sale for breast cancer, <laughs> you'd be like, well, OK. Who was particularly red in the face about it? Cameron, presumably. I'm trying to think who was red in, the, was face, red in the face, apart from George Osman, but he doesn't, she hasn't got any blood. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how was George reacting on the night of the defeat? What did he have to say for himself? Well, I think it was shock. I mean, the House of Lords is traditionally there to vote down bills put forward by uh, the Labour Party. Yes. And... <laughs> <laughs> They suddenly got the wrong end of the stick and threw out a Tory bill. So everyone's very cross. Yes. And the Tories, you know, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna team up with Corbyn and abolish the House of Commons. <laughs> House of Commons. Or the Lords. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember which it is now. Is that a sort of a kind of acute political analysis that has made your name with it? <laughs> <laughs> On the night, though, George did seem to get stuck in a bit of a loop. Have a look at this. Tonight, unelected Labour and Liberal Lords have defeated a financial matter passed by the elected House of Commons, and David Cameron and I are clear that this raises constitutional issues that need to be dealt with. Will you take action against them to punish them? Well, let's be clear. Unelected Labour and... Liberal Lords have voted down a matter passed by the elected House of Commons that raises constitutional issues, and David Cameron and I are clear they will need to be dealt with. Chancellor, you also said this was your judgment, and it turned out to be wrong. That's damaging for you, isn't it? Well, let's be clear. <laughs> Labour and Liberal Lords, who are not elected, have voted against measures in a Conservative budget, and that raises constitutional issues. <laughs> There's a switch on his back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only. <laughs> How did he vary it the next day when he had to defend what happened in the Commons? What did he say? Did he sing it? <laughs> <laughs> he said, last night, unelected Labour and Liberal <laughs> peers... No, sorry, it's my mistake. It is exactly, <laughs> exactly the same thing. Um, now, uh, Osborne wasn't the only one stuck on repeat, though. His, cabinet colleagues, they, they spent a lot of the week saying that he was in listening mode. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's as creepy as all his other modes. Um, <laughs> so is this damaged George, do you think? Yes. Fatally? One can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the people who proposed the most important motions against the cuts were Baroness Meacher, Baroness Manzur and Baroness Hollis or as the Daily Mail call them, cannabis campaigner, quango <laughs> queen and failed MP. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was it took the nuclear option? It was Baroness Mansour who tried to pass the fatal motion. Fatal motion. 
which is what did for Elvis, I think. Um, <laughs> it does serve them right for creating all those peers. They didn't used to be that many, and now there are 800 of them. Yeah, to be fair, half of them get burned down during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> And you'd think that given so many peerages, the Tories would have a majority of the House of Lords by now, but they don't. There have been veiled threats that Cameron would flood the House of Lords with a hundred new Lords. If you were Cameron, who would you choose to parachute in there? Jeremy Clarkson. That's who they should put mm. in. That'd get rid of him off the telly, wouldn't it? <laughs> Nought to 800 in 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have a denim robe, though, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and following the votes, there was an interesting discussion between uh, Baroness Meacher and Michael Ellis, MP. It's worth seeing if she was convinced by anything that Michael Ellis had to say. Let's have a look. The House of Commons holds sway over financial matters is a crucial one to the functioning of our constitution. We Otherwise, we have self-appointed people in the House of Lords. They have had that temptation placed in their path on dozens of occasions over the last century. Resisted that for a hundred years tonight, they haven't. Uh, it's wonderful that they've got her down there translating for the hearing impaired. <laughs> so, in a bid to make sure this never happens again, of course, Lord Strathclyde has announced he's going to do a rapid review into curbing the House of Lords' powers. I'll give you a bonus point if any of you can give me the real name of Lord Strathclyde. Bunty. <laughs> <laughs> Is it one of those bonkers long names? Yes, he's called Thomas Galloway Dunlop Drouard de Bleaky Galbraith. Nah. <laughs> Another man of the people. Well, he's also got product placement in the middle of his name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> he just he's... can't trust the Tories. <laughs> Did he change his name in wet weather? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, several of the papers identified one clear supervillain in all this. Who was that? Well, apart from the obvious one. Who's the obvious one? <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yes. Mega rich musical gargoyle, Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> He flew in from New York to vote for tax credit cuts. It was his first vote in over two years. He's previously voted just 30 times out of a possible 1,898 Ooh. in 14 years. But he did deny he had flown back specifically for the votes. Anyone know why he says he was in town? He was here for an opening of one of his productions somewhere. A new one? musical called Cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he did say he was in town to watch the revival of Cats, yeah. the musical. Yeah. yeah. But surely he's seen that already. Uh, <laughs> or maybe he's just got a bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> what Christmas treat will millions of families now be missing out on? Their very own cut. Yeah. <laughs> they were looking forward to it. Christmas Day, open up the presents, nothing there. <laughs> All your money gone. <laughs> a festive letter from George telling them what money they were going to lose with the cuts. Nothing says Christmas quite like a letter from gorgeous George letting you know you're £1,300 worse off. It's like Ebenezer Osborne. He's a last-minute change of mind. <laughs> with tiny Tim Farron. <laughs> <laughs> the lip Tim genius. Uh, and with all the damage done to George Osborne's reputation, it's a good job Boris Johnson didn't steal some of the limelight with one of his ridiculous photo opportunities.
Prime Minister's questions then, what was the big question of the week for David Cameron? Will the bill make people suffer, basically? Mm. And it was said by, was it someone called Karen, I think, or something? Yes. They're always said by somebody, aren't they, yeah. these questions? <laughs> it's like a sort of ventriloquist dummy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, are, are we going to suffer? <laughs> On this terrible bill. <laughs> I can see an act. <laughs> <laughs> and how many times did uh, Jeremy feel the need to ask this question? Six. Mm. So he, he, must have, he must have got a straight answer one of those times, right? No. Ah. The Prime Minister didn't have a reply. Well, you think that's the big question at Prime Minister's Question Time, but of course it wasn't. It was uh, from the MP Stephen Metcalf, who asked, will my right honourable friend join me in celebrating the fact that <laughs> one in 10 of the world's tractors are built in Basildon? <laughs> and what was the other big story about tax from the Commons this week? Tampon tax. <sighs> Tell us about that, Catherine. Well, uh, there is a 5% tax on sanitary products because they are considered to be luxury items. Now, while that does not affect me, obviously, I do not use tampons. I'm a single mother, not a king. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. You're taking food out of your children's mouth to pay for tampons. I mean, you'd be literally better off taking the food out of their mouths than using that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been using carrier bags, David. <laughs> I'm better off financially. I thumbed two of those up there before I came on the show. <laughs> it's insane that this should be taxed. And this is just dehumanizing to call it a luxury. I just, uh, there are no jokes. People say, oh, period jokes from women. There are not a lot of period jokes for the same reason there are not a lot of leukemia jokes. It's too sad. <laughs> Oh, we've got a lot of period jokes coming up. <laughs> no! We really, we do. Yes, it is the tampon tax. The VAT on tampons has been maintained because, uh, uh, as Catherine says, it's considered a luxury item, unlike Jaffa cakes, which are exempt from VAT because they are an essential. <laughs> There's your answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we play a game of luxury buys or basic supplies? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Fingers on buzzers, okay. team. Uh, luxury buy or basic supply. A live kangaroo. <laughs> well, it depends who's buying, isn't it? It's got to be a luxury... For whom is it an essential? Well, for another kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going for? Uh, basic supply. It's a luxury buy, are you luxury. insane? <laughs> of course it is. Luxury buy or basic supply. Honey bees. Bees? What, bees? Yes. Or honey from bees? No, honey bees. What, are you buying them? Yeah. I think that's a basic supply. I think it's a luxury. Leave them alone. Eat the honey. I'm not trying bees. Which are you going for? I'm going to take the your plants first... need them. I'm going to take your first they answer. Tax? It is a basic supply. Yeah. You're quite right. <laughs> luxury buy or basic supply? Bumblebees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously they're a luxury, aren't they? Because they've got fur and them. Yeah, uh, exactly. that's, that's it. They're like the Sarchi yeah. insects. Yes, this is the shock news that the House of Lords does, in fact, serve a useful purpose. <laughs> As a result of the Lords' rebellion, the Chancellor has been forced to rewrite his autumn statement, which now reads, damn shit and bollocks. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Treasury survived a rebellion over the so-called tampon tax, a relief for George Osborne, who's going through a tricky period at the moment. <laughs> Paul and Catherine, take a look at this. Yeah. Oh, uh, bad news. Killer on the plate. Um, yes, this is the um, bad news. What the what? Eating too many sausages could lead to you exploding like an atom bomb. <laughs> Eating sausages is as dangerous as nuclear war. Or is it, or is it plutonium? Strictly speaking, it's plutonium. Yes. Plutonium? Banned substance now, the sausage. Oh. It's not quite as dangerous as eating plutonium, is it? No. Unless Putin's, you know, I, I serving. I think MI5 will be assassinating people. 
by giving them sausages and bacon. <laughs> Meat cancer's been all over the news. Yes. And bacon's the worst offender, so it's a good day for Jews and Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, processed meat is now in the top class of five World Health Organization classifications for carcinogenic substances harmful to humans. Right. But to put things in perspective, <laughs> eating processed meat increases the risk of cancer by 18%. Mm -hmm. I think plutonium's a little higher. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Will you have to change your diet now that this news has been um, leaked to you? Do you know, I think I'll just risk it. <laughs> <laughs> risk it for a brisket. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the World Health Organization has tested over 940 substances and only one has been found not to cause cancer. Any idea what it was? Plutonium. <laughs> <laughs> it's caprolactum, a substance found in yoga pants. <laughs> so the Guardian went looking for individual reactions to the news. What did John and Bobby the Butchers have to say? <laughs> Well, you've got to die of something, did you? There <laughs> <laughs> we are, love. <laughs> he said, it's all about moderation. It's fine as long as you're not eating 400 <laughs> sausages a day. And the report went on, a man who was walking off with a box of 80 sausages said, it's too late now anyway. <laughs> The Daily Star interviewed a very unusual group of people, which included Kat Batley, Jonathan Hard, and Darren Banghard. He obviously didn't have a problem with sausages. <laughs> <laughs> Who or what might save us? Vegetarianism. Tomato, they're genetically modifying tomatoes to kill cancer. That's that right? Absolutely mm, right, brilliant. yes. Oh. According to scientists at the John Innes Centre in Norwich, the super tomato packs in more life-extending compounds than 50 bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be as healthy as an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are foods that are medicine, and there are foods that are poison, and there's nothing in between. But right now, our poison to medicine scale is off the charts. We're just ingesting, like, bacon and food that's not food, and bread. Don't get me started on bread, David. You believe it's, it's the devil, right? I, I've never eaten bread, even when I was a child. It right. looks like eating a napkin. That's not food. I mean, historically, it is food. I mean, all those ducks can't be wrong. <laughs> It's bad for ducks, too. It's quack cocaine. <laughs> Which other harmful foodstuff is the government being urged to sugar. deal with? Sugar. sugar. Yes. A tax on sugar would cut down on obesity, apparently. But why won't David Cameron have anything to do with the sugar tax? Do the people who make sugar contribute to the Conservative Party in any way? <laughs> that yeah. is an appalling suggestion. <laughs> Lord Sugar. Yes. <laughs> the actual response from the government is that um, if you put on a sugar tax, unbelievably, it will affect mostly the poorer people in the country. So much better just to take their credits away. <laughs> and then they won't buy fizzy drinks and sugar. Mm, so absolutely. they are caring. Yeah. In their own way. There was a man on the radio, it was really funny, and he was opposing the sugar tax. He rang in and he said, the sugar tax is not going to work. Look at the carrier bag tax. That didn't work on me, I just brought my own bags. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Times, David Cameron does not want to be seen to be hitting the poor. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be seen to be doing it. He yeah. draws the blinds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what kind of damage is sugar doing to people's lives in Somerset? I think they have really good lives in Somerset. Well, they did until this happened. <laughs> They're being attacked by sugar-addicted ponies. <laughs> They've been dreading this day for decades. <laughs> and they got organised. According to the Daily Telegraph, some ponies have been spotted becoming unusually aggressive as they battle over biscuits, <laughs> chocolate and other treats left by tourists. Mm. Others have been known to approach parked cars, pushing their heads inside in search of a sugar fix. <laughs> Want to see how terrifying the horse problem has become? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, my God. We can't live in a country like this. <laughs> Calls for sugar tax have intensified this week. Sugar is causing problems in Somerset, where wild ponies are confronting tourists in an aggressive pursuit of sugary confections. According to the Mail, one woman visitor was left with a broken leg when attacked by a pony. Even worse, when the three other horses then erected a screen around her and loaded a bolt gun. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Daily Star, scientists also claim that cheese is as addictive as heroin. <laughs> you know you've got a serious problem when you're desperately trying to find an unused vein in your stilton. <laughs> <laughs> on we go to round two, the jigsaw of news. Fingers on buzzers, buzz when you know what this is. Jermaine Greer. Oh. Grayson. Jermaine Greer. She's got into a lot of trouble. She's not allowed to speak at some university because of her views on the trans community. That's correct. Jermaine Gere has, has cancelled a planned appearance at Cardiff University after she was accused of having misogynist views towards transgender women. Yes. She said, yeah, transgender women can't be women. And she told Newsnight, just because you lop off your dick, it doesn't make you a woman. <laughs> makes you slightly less of a man. <laughs> <laughs> but not a woman. Uh, how has she gone about defending herself? I don't know. She was interviewed on Newsnight, I think. She said, I'm not saying that people should not be allowed to go through that procedure. All I'm saying is that it doesn't make them a woman. And she used uh, rather an interesting analogy to prove her point. I don't know what that was. Yes. She said, if I put on a brown coat and, and, I, and uh, I grew my ears long, it wouldn't make me a cock spaniel. Or something it, like that. It's terrifyingly correct. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Pity because uh, she couldn't have chosen some other dog. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what did uh, transgender actor Rebecca Root call Greer in response to her comments? Misogynistic, uh, a, um, um, a, a glorified pantomime dame or something like that. Or a pantomime baddie. Yes, that's it. Pantomime baddie. She called her a negative force. She's like your worst baddie in a classic panto. It's all getting a bit ugly, sisters. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Jermaine Greer, a feminist who uh, acknowledges the struggle of women throughout the years, just because she hasn't experienced the struggle of a transgendered person leading up to today, then she shouldn't discount it. I think it's quite mean what she said. Awful, in fact. But shouldn't she be allowed to say something awful, isn't that...? You should be allowed to say whatever awful things you like. And a, in a university context, isn't freedom of speech sort of what universities are for? You don't disagree with people, you, you just shut them up? I think That's not really a good idea, no, is it? No, a no-platform situation is not the best one. Well, I think the students are entitled to not turn up. I'd like, I wouldn't turn up if Bill Cosby came to speak at my school. <laughs> and I want to learn about comedy, but I'm not going. Is he likely to be invited? <laughs> <laughs> We're both banned from my school at this point. <laughs> yes, this is Jermaine Greer's latest cock-up that has given the transgender community the willies. <laughs> which, frankly, is the last thing they want. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Here's yeah. another one for you. Buzz when you know what this is. Yes, uh, Ian and Grayson. This is apparently a 15-year-old from Northern Ireland is meant to have hacked into Talk Talk's computer and got all people's personal details and put them on the web. Exactly. Four million customers of the broadband and phone provider Talk Talk. Their details were allegedly stolen by a teenage boy. We're not allowed to reveal his name. He's yet to be convicted of any crime and he is a minor. Fortunately, the son don't care about that, and they've named him as five foot tall. <laughs> With a name like that, he shouldn't be hard to trace. <laughs> <laughs> Just go round all the schools, and when the registers call, wait till you hear that noise, and you've got him. <laughs> I feel sorry for the IT guy. He'd be like, oh, it must have been China, or some North Koreans got through my firewall. No, it was a child. Uh -oh. <laughs> the Daily Mail said he had a single mum. Oh, well, he's definitely guilty, then. On behalf of all single moms, I'm just glad that our bastard children are finally participating in white-collar crime. <laughs> <laughs>
Who says there's no aspiration in the world anymore? It's fun, like, you have to worry about your son knocking his door. What do you do? You better be wanking him there and not bringing down a corporation. <laughs> The two activities aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how quick were Talk Talk to respond to their security breach? Well, they didn't tell anybody, did they, for about a week, something like that? I think it was 24 hours after oh, 24 being hours. So. But to be fair, they were experiencing a very high volume of calls at that time. <laughs> This is the so-called babyface hacker who allegedly carried out a damaging cyber attack on Talk Talk. The hooded teenager was arrested by the police and when questioned replied, yeah, whatever, you're not my dad, boring. <laughs> Talk Talk boss Dido Harding said they will handle compensation claims for their four million users on a case-to-case -case basis. Bad news for loyal customer Zachariah Zimmerman. <laughs> <laughs> The 15-year-old boy who was arrested is described as a reclusive loner obsessed with violent video games. It makes you proud to be British. In America, you'd have gunned down half your school by now. We've got to feel good about ourselves where we can, haven't we? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Count our blessing. Absolutely. There was yeah. a woman in America the other day who was just shot by her dog. <laughs> her dog. He was a chocolate lab, so the police were already all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Here's another one for you. Who is it? Yes, that's Paul and Catherine. I refuse to recognise or remember who this man is. <laughs> it's Tony Blair. He's sort of partially apologised, uh, but not really. Um... I think this is an attempt to sort of get in before the verdict. Yes. We do now know that the Chilcot report is expected to be published June or July next year. Six years we've been waiting, six years. Longer than the entire Second World War to yes. come up with the one sentence we want. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> What did he specifically apologise for? He said he was sorry that the intelligence turned out not to be accurate. Yes. Speaking in an interview with American broadcaster CNN, he said, I apologise for the fact that the intelligence we received was wrong. That's not really fair, given that he manipulated the evidence to make sure it wasn't accurate. So he didn't really apologise. Well, what has former weapons inspector Hans Blix said about this this week? Anyone hear this? He accused Blair of misrepresenting intelligence about Iraq's WMD program, as you say. When asked whether Blair had lied, he said, well, I'm a diplomat, so I'm not using such, such words. <laughs> but, in substance, yes. <laughs> um, so away from war and terrorism, yes, yes. and uh, on to salacious relationship gossip. <laughs> Lovely. Who has Blair's ex-pal Rupert Murdoch been enjoying the company of recently? Yes, Paul. Well, according to Private Eye, it's Jerry Hall. Is this correct? Let's throw over we to Private Eye. We got it from Eye. the Sunday Times. <laughs> <laughs> it was in the Sunday Times. Yeah, I read the story and I thought, is that true? I mean, honestly, you know, talk about out of your league, Jerry. <laughs> um, well, according to the Daily Mail, Murdoch is not Hall's type. She likes younger, obviously handsome men. <laughs> Cultured and with a lot of charisma, it says here. Mm. But according to friends, it is evident that Rupert is as vigorous in his private life as he is in his business. No, no. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> a lot of you have got a picture in your head, haven't mm. you? <laughs> So to Labour leaders and international relations, uh, what did Jeremy Corbyn say about having dinner with the Chinese president? Yes, Ian. He said it was incredibly boring. He did. He said, he said oh, God, it was one of the most boring nights I've ever had. <laughs> and this comes from the man who photographs Drain cover, so that really was an insult. <laughs> What startling revelations did The Sun uncover about Jeremy Corbyn this week? What are the stunning revelations? <laughs> well, The Sun tracked down Jeremy Corbyn's wife's niece, who lived with him until recently, who disclosed that he enjoys watching EastEnders, tending his allotment, baking bread, watching and reading the news, and making jam. 
What a bastard. <laughs> And finally, another international statesman revealed something this week. Who and what was that? I think international statesman's pushing it, but... It's not Sepp Blatter. It's Sepp Blatter. Ah, yes. yes. Yeah. He shocked us all not by saying that the, um, choosing Russia to host the World Cup was a foregone conclusion before the actual vote. Mm. So it was rigged. <laughs> yes, I know, it's shocking, isn't it? It is. The Russians will be furious to find out they didn't win it legitimately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Putin will be angry as hell. Yes, this is the news that Tony Blair had sort of said sorry for Iraq. During the interview, Tony Blair added, by the way, I always point out, I did actually win an election after Iraq. <laughs> Mr Blair, no one is doubting your ability to deceive people on a massive <laughs> scale. <laughs> Also this week, Sepp Blatter revealed that even before voting began, it had already been decided that Russia would host the 2018 World Cup. But he denied that this was doing Russia any favours, as they would lose in the final 3-2 to Germany. <laughs> <laughs> After the English bids to host the 2018 World Cup finals received only one vote, Sepp Blatter declared that England are bad losers. Really, we're not, Sepp? We're, sorry. We're brilliant at it. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's why. That's the same joke. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's good though. <laughs> no, go back. We'll do it again. You can read the last bit. <laughs> Actually, set. <laughs> if you look at their record since 1966, I think you'll find that England are very good at losing. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Which means, at the end of this round, <laughs> it's four points for Ian and three points for Paul. <laughs> Ten now for the odd one out round. It's just one between you this week. Your four are Charlotte Proudman, the Dalai Lama, James Bond and air conditioning. Is it something to do with sexism? Charlotte Proudman has been the victim of sexism on LinkedIn. Right. And all the others have been accused of sexism. I mean, I think, I think air conditioning was recently outed as a sexist. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Because it favours the male metabolism. And uh, I don't know about the Dalai Lama, but James Bond is practically a synonym <laughs> for sexism. It's a full, frank and fundamentally 100% correct answer. Yes. Very good thing. Proudman sparked a media storm when she accused a fellow lawyer of being sexist for commenting on her photo on the professional online platform LinkedIn. Also, Charlotte Proudman has stolen her hairstyle from someone. <laughs> and I've, got, I've, got, I've got this hair registered. <laughs> Ian, I think you'll find a Dalai Lama was pulled up. <laughs> Daniel Craig recently called James Bond a misogynist. Uh, He's a bit, a bit of a misogynist in the way that Oscar Pistorius is a bit lucky he wasn't black. <laughs> so how has the latest instalment uh, of Bond Spectre attracted criticism for its apparently sexist attitude? Is it because the, the lady in it is an older woman, but Daniel Craig said she's not older, she's just Bond's age. Monica Bellucci yeah. is 51, the oldest Bond girl yet, uh, which was hailed as a revolutionary portrayal of women in the franchise, but she appears on screen for just seven minutes, in which time he manages to meet her, sleep with her, and extract the information he needs. <laughs> is that all one swift movement? <laughs> <laughs> Air conditioning has been accused of being sexist for being set at too cold a temperature for female office workers. There is, of course, a simpler way of making women feel warmer in the office. Just double glaze that glass ceiling. <laughs> yeah. And the Dalai Lama has outraged feminists by saying that any potential female successor to his role would need to be very, very attractive. Some Tibetan Buddhist priests believe that in the moment of his death, the reincarnated Dalai Lama enters the body of a small child. Whereas some Catholic priests think, why wait? <laughs> <laughs> I 
time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication, The Kite Flyer. Subscribe now. No strings. <laughs> we start with... My wife is not a kite fan, but she what and tolerates what? Uh, my wife is not a kite fan, but she likes to give mine a good pull and <laughs> tolerates a bit of wind. <laughs> my wife is not a kite fan, but she takes photos at kite festivals and tolerates my long stints in the Kite Flyer Forum. <laughs> Next, Chewbacca arrested for what? Smoking while there's children in the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> <laughs> Chewbacca arrested for mm -hmm. campaigning in the Ukraine. What? Yes, this is the news that a man dressed as Chewbacca was campaigning for a candidate called Darth Vader in a Ukraine election. Fair enough, with Putin on the doorstep, a vote for Darth Vader is a vote for peace. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is, being carted off by police. <laughs> <laughs> And here he is in court. <laughs> he looks like he's been roughed up since he was put into that car. <laughs> Next, Henry VIII's life ruined by... Is it allergy to wedding cake? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> it's Michael Gove. Ruined by Michael Gove? Yeah. What, has he dug him up? <laughs> is he a time traveller? Look what I'm asking. Is he a time traveller? <laughs> in a way... In a way... Renowned Henry VIII impersonator Mike Farley <laughs> has seen his work opportunities dwindle after the Tudors were slashed from the national curriculum. Explaining the appeal to school kids of the Tudors, Mike said, if it wasn't for the Tudors, we may not have a monarchy today. And there's all of the beheadings and all of the gore about that time that really appeals to kids. <laughs> but they can get all that stuff online now, Mike. <laughs> Next. The Pope has a good job, but he doesn't get to what or what? The Pope has a good job, but he doesn't get to internet date. Or does he? <laughs> <laughs> the Pope has a good job, but he doesn't get to take time off or fly a kite or stuff a ferret. <laughs> He doesn't get to wear trousers or culottes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> culottes. Is it, it must be all of those. It, all, all of which answers are more plausible than the actual truth, which is, is, the Pope has a good job, but he doesn't get to wiggle his hips or drink a few glasses of wine after a show. A <laughs> show? According to Rod Stewart, who expressed these views this week in an interview with The Sun. Rod, do you know nothing about Catholicism? <laughs> <laughs> the Pope has wine during the show. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, parachuting beavers what in the 1940s? Was yes. a popular euphemism. <laughs> For what? Invading Crete. Creek? Crete. Oh. Oh, sorry, you were on a beaver theme. You were calling sex invading the creek, and I. <laughs> I loved that. I loved that. Well, we can do a retake. If you like. <laughs> it's a more interesting answer than the rather obvious. Parachuting beavers killed 15 civilians in the 1940s. Were they trained by MI5? Yeah, but you can't you can't direct the parachuting beaver. Once he's out there, he's out there. <laughs> Good for all those German dams, though. Yeah. Ooh, fair <laughs> Parachuting beavers um, imitated Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> we are parachuting beavers. <laughs> <laughs> parachuting beavers thrown out of planes in the 1940s. <laughs> An historian in the US state of Idaho has unearthed a video of the Great Beaver Trip of 1948, a relocation plan for the state's beavers. Here it is. Now into the air and down they swing, box open, and a most unusual and novel trip ends for Mr. Beaver. What? <laughs> How 
wouldn't it be cheaper to drop them from planes <laughs> rather than just take them in a car and just say, there you are? <laughs> I'm not flying easy, Jet again, thanks very much. <laughs> well, hello, boy. <laughs> what happens if the box doesn't open when they hit the ground as well? They're beavers. <laughs> <laughs> So, at the end of the quiz, the final scores are Paul and Catherine have five, but the winners are Ian and Grayson with six. Yeah. <laughs> On which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Grayson Perry, Paul Merton and Catherine Ryan. And I leave you with the news that, as George Osborne begins to look vulnerable, leadership rival Boris Johnson plans his next move. <laughs> In Zurich, Sepp Blatter explains how, despite being president of FIFA, evidence of corruption never reached him. <laughs> and CCTV captures the moment just before Prince Philip finally loses it with the Queen. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>